You're listening to the Wayward Atheist Podcast. Hello, everyone. If this is your first time listening, thank you for joining us. This is a podcast where borders collide, where the gloves are off, where filters are removed, where we tell you exactly what we think about the news, politics, and religion. The Wayward Atheist Podcast is dedicated to free thought, reason, and the pursuit of truth. You can follow us on Twitter at Wayward Atheist, on Spreaker, Stitcher, and iTunes. You can email us at waywardatheistpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a comment on our Facebook page. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of The Wayward Atheist has been brought to you by the crafty freethinker. Tired of boring old jewelry and charms? Why not wear a motherfucking T-Rex around your neck or a pendant of the Scarlet A? Handmade, secular, and science jewelry from the crafty freethinker gives you a nice alternative to boring old jewelry. Find the Crafty Freethinker on Etsy and Amazon. Links are in the show notes, or simply Google the Crafty Freethinker as one word. Hello and welcome to the Wayward Atheist Podcast. I'm Dave, a.k.a. The Great White North. I'm Big Black Gay Dave. I'm Ed, The Everyday Atheist. And tonight we are joined by... John Sheehan, comedian, atheist. Awesome. And where are you from, John? I'm from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, in Labrador. Awesome, awesome. About an hour outside St. John's. So uh, before we get into the show proper, I got a little announcement. Tomorrow, uh, Michael Fowler and his fiance Jessica, are getting married. So I just want to say congratulations and good luck with that. Yeah, congratulations, guys. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Marriage. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, idiots. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it, man. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to play a little clip for you right now so you guys can get familiar with John, and uh, then we'll come back for our interview. If you, ever go out, if you ever want to go out and have a good time, and you can't find someone to go with you, go by yourself. But this is what you got to do. You got to pick a friend and leave messages on their machine. <laughs> Updating them. <laughs> Updating them on how your night is going. And it starts off innocently enough. I was living over to, I was living in Gander a few years ago with a friend of mine, Mike Power from Harbor Grace. And, uh, Mike was, been, Mike was gone home for the weekend. I had just gotten some news and everything. I wanted to go out and have a good time. I couldn't find no one to go with me. Everyone was busy or whatever. So I decided to go by myself and leave messages for Mike, updating him on how my night was going. And it started off innocently enough. Beep! Mike, it's John, it's 8 o'clock. I'm at the club. I just got a beer ordered. I'm doing pretty good. I might get a feed of wings or something. Alright, I'll talk to you later on. Click. Beep! Mike. 9.30. I got a couple into me now, but I'm not doing too bad. I'll talk to you later on. Click. Beep. Mike. Mike. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I got a few into me now. I'm not, I'm not, oh, she's cute. I got to go. I'll talk to you later. Click. Beep. Mike. 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 Listen. It's a minute later. My face hurts. Uh, they tells me I'm drunk, which would explain the slurred speech and the big pee scene in front of the people. I'm going home now. I'll talk to you later. Click. Beep. Mike. <laughs> Mike, you home? I just, I know you're not home. Listen, <laughs> I'm calling from the cell phone, which is a bit fucked because I don't have one. <laughs> this is a nice coat. <laughs> I can't find my keys. I'll talk to you later. Click. Beep, Mike. My, 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 stupid fucking name. Listen! <laughs> uh, I, I, I had to beat down the door. What a fright I got. I saw a rat. So I grabbed a shovel and laid into it. Problem solved. I'll talk to you later. Click. Beep! Moi! <laughs> Moi, listen! I'm sorry. First thing tomorrow, I'm buying you a new hamster. (laughs) 
<laughs> and his cage is in hard shape too. <laughs> The toilet's clogged. <laughs> I'm half sober now. <laughs> I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and fix the door. I'll talk to you later. Click. <laughs> Beep! <laughs> Moin! Oh, Moin, listen. I'm calling from down to the emerge. <laughs> Uh, I'm at the health science, so you pick me up next week. Listen, <laughs> uh, if you get home in the next little while, have a look around for a finger, will you? <laughs> There's only a pinky, there's not much odds. <laughs> What purpose do a pinky serve, Mike? <laughs> Is me middle finger still me middle finger? <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Click. <laughs> Beep, Mike. Oh no. I gotta go now. <laughs> well, listen. Never mind about the finger. It was in <laughs> me pocket. <laughs> And don't worry about the door. It wasn't our house. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks so much. My name is John Sheehan. Oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. So, John, uh, a couple quick questions. Just how did you first become an atheist? Oh, I guess um, I was, uh, I've always had questions my whole life. I was raised Roman Catholic. I went to an all-guys school uh, taught by the Christian brothers. Nothing happened. Um <laughs> you have to there. fucking throw that out there for sure. I gotta throw it out there. Nothing happened, you know. And uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was always, uh, I always had doubts. I, w I would say I always had questions, but I never really. And I think one of the things I talk about sometimes is that uh, I don't think I didn't direct any of my intellect towards the questioning. You know, I was in doctrine growing up, so it was kind of th something you accept. And I think once once you do that, once you see the first few cracks. And once you start to see, once you start to see, there are more questions than there are, will ever be answers. I think uh, that's when the whole thing, the whole house of cards, starts to fall apart. Awesome, awesome. Uh, one of the things that, uh, well, going back to your comedy, one of the things that um, that really struck me um, is that you know it's it's Newfoundland. You can feel the Newfoundland flavor from it. But um, how do you, when you go to do a comedy, how do you, uh, uh, like say in an, um, another town or province? How do you negotiate offending people? Are you worried about that at all? Is that something that comes across your mind? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I've never really brought religion into the act. Uh, it's always been kind of a, a personal thing of mine. Uh, I've only really become outspoken in the last year, a uh, year and a half maybe. And it's only now that I've really uh, started to consider bringing it into my act. Now, from one point of view, I'm a, you know, it is show business. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not silly enough to, I know that Newfoundland and Labrador is uh, there's a lot of uh, Bible Belt territory and there's a lot of uh, religious towns still, and it's still predominantly a religious place. Uh, so I'm not going to alienate an already small audience. So I think most of my comedy comes from my uh, family material, uh, a lot of politics. You know, I follow politics, so I do some political stuff. And uh, generally just everyday things. I've never really brought the, uh, the religious aspect into the act yet. How do you uh, how do you find your your Newfoundland act plays in the rest of Canada and maybe in the U.S.? Well, I haven't been fortunate enough to go to the U.S. yet to do comedy. I've uh, but I've played the Halifax Fest three times, Halifax Comedy Festival. I've done the Winnipeg one. I've done uh, tours out in B.C. and Alberta, and uh, headline Yuck Yucks clubs in uh, Calgary, Ontario. And the thing is, I drop ninety percent of the material that is Newfoundland related whenever I go anywhere. And um, I just slow down a little bit because I know when I'm home, I tend to speed up with with, uh, with, with the accent and everything. Yeah, why do uh, Newfies talk so fast? Well, we all talk, so we each got to speed up to just get a word in edgewise. <laughs> you feel that, like, uh, we just wouldn't understand the humor because we're not from there? Maybe you're... Yeah, you're it's a lot, of, a lot of, about, of, a lot about of places, kind of inside jokes. people. Yeah. 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 Um, mentioned that only recently you've decided to bring in religion into your comedy. Um 
do you want to discuss why at a certain period of time that, you know, only recently? Is there something that happened in your life? Is there something that's going no, on? No, and that's what a lot of people, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people, uh, when they first find out that it is, they always ask if something happened. No, nothing happened. I just, uh, you know, when I'm sitting down working on material, I've always thought that the best material for any comedian comes from yourself and comes from real life. And I've always said that me with in front of a microphone is just me with the volume turned up, basically. And uh, in the past year, since it's become more and more uh, a part of my life, and you know, I've got kids, and, uh, you know, uh, basically teenagers now, and one is out of his teens, and uh, they've all they they know how I feel about things, and I don't see I don't push non-belief on them, and I don't allow anybody to push belief on them. And uh, the only thing I tell them is that don't ever let anyone tell you you can't question because question everything. Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, question everything is is a really the goal of parents, I think, to Absolutely. John, your your humor is I mean, it's really uh, I I love your co- comedy. It makes me laugh to no end. But do you find that uh being from Newfoundland where where a lot of comic uh, comedy happens on a regular basis where really funny people uh, do you think that informs your comedy and makes you uh, makes you a a, uh, a better comic? Does it come natural from being in Newfoundland? Uh, I think yeah, part of it, sure. I mean, uh, but I mean, I think more so it comes from uh, the people you keep around you. You know, uh, all my friends, well, none of them have gone into comedy or anything, but it was always a funny group. You know, we were always cracking jokes and we were always, you know, tormenting when we were growing up. And I think uh, the trick in Newfoundland and Labrador to do Stand up, especially, is not to fall into the. Um, I don't want to be the guy who can make Newfoundlanders laugh. You know, I don't want to be. I want. I don't want to be tied down in that regard. And uh, some people do character work, and it works fine for them to make careers out of it. Great, good on you. But I'm a comic first, a stand up comic first, and I want that to be able to play universally. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think what you're doing is really good. I I, I got to say, I've, I've enjoyed it for. Uh, I've, I've watched all your your clips uh, on uh, YouTube so far that I've just um, from Halifax Festival, even uh, some other ones that have been put on like thirty second clips. They've been oh, yeah. they really are, are are different. You can tell that when you're in a different place that you uh, you really try to keep it just for humor for the sake of humor, which is really good. I like yeah, that. absolutely. And uh, you know, I've done conventions outside of the province where. Um, I don't even say where I'm from, and a lot. Of, it's funny because a lot of Americans will guess Irish. <laughs> yeah, you and, and you have a stronger accent than, um, say, me, but not. Yeah. But w- when we go away, we never, uh, uh, we never think of ourselves of ha- as having accents. But I can tell what part of the province someone's up from. By sure. The- yeah. Absolutely. Funny thing is, you know, I just spent the summer, my second summer in a row, doing Shakespeare, and. Uh, the, uh, a lot of people, a lot of comic friends of mine from uh, from outside the province joke about Newfie accent for Shakespeare. Oh my gosh! But the funny thing is, it plays it plays for that better than most accents do. And uh, any dialect expert in the world will tell you that certain parts of Newfoundland and Labrador is the closest you will come to Shakespearean language in the modern world. H- have you done a, an anti theist set yet? I have not. No, uh, I don't hide it. Uh, I haven't done it in the act yet because I haven't really sat down and tried to flush out a full. I think that's that's kind of a dream of mine. That's something that I want to kind of focus a full show on because I I don't think I can go there for five minutes and then leave yeah. it and go do, to another topic. Do you have like five or ten minutes done yet, or have you sat down to it at all? No, no, I have. I have. I think I've got a solid. If I ever when I tried out, I think I got a solid fifteen to twenty right now. Uh, can you come? That I, that can you come to with. Ottawa when you do it? Absolutely, Ottawa is a pretty um, uptight town. But yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an uptight. Like it's a pretty politically wise. correct town. Yeah, they're uptight conservative wise. But I mean, you go to Absolute Comedy. Like yeah, I, you know what? I have not been to Absolute Comedy yet. I keep uh, a couple of friends of mine tell me I got to check that out. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not uptight. Know, that's there that's at all. definitely on the list. Yeah. Uh, um, one last question: um, Do you find censorship uh, and PC culture very hard for comics in this day and age? I haven't run across it yet, to be honest with you, but because of style of comedy. I mean, and uh, I do convention work. If they tell me not to swear, I don't swear. If they tell me a certain topic is taboo, I'll leave it alone. Because the way I look at it, when I'm hired to a corporate event, I'm representing myself. 
uh, whatever agent booked me. And uh, for that three to four hour time frame from the time I get to the hotel, settle in, go downstairs, do the gig, go back upstairs, for that time frame, I'm their employee. And so if I was working for them full time, I wouldn't break any of those taboos. So I try to stay away from that kind of stuff if I'm told to. I have another question. Uh, I don't want you to give away, you know, any, any, uh, secrets about what you're about to do, but where do you find is when you're coming up with these sketches, with these comedy, with these jokes, mm-hmm. what do you, what do you think? What's your approach, first of all, in, in trying to make people laugh about religion? When you're talking about incorporating religion into your comedy and yeah. what do you find? Like what, what inspires you about religion and comedy and what do you think is going to make people laugh in general? You know, that's the trick. Uh, right now I got topics that I know I find just ironically funny and it's trying to find that little twist that'll make an audience kind of, uh, cause I know that a lot of this is going to be nervous laughter at first. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm kind of going into it with that in mind. I know what to expect. You know, uh, I'm wondering, you know, people are obviously obsessed with a God who's an obvious schizophrenic. You know, he's, uh, in the, fir- in the first book of, the, of Genesis, he talks about how, uh, you know, people believe God is the Alpha and the Omega, the great I am, the beginning and the end, you know, uh, but in the very first chapter, he says, uh, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. And I just don't know who he's talking to, you know, and so I'm thinking, this trend, <laughs> you know, there's, this is a God with multiple personality disorder. And the, fu- the fact that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two entirely different gods, uh, I find that funny too. And that's something I'm, wor- I'm going to work on towards. And, uh, he's got a short temper. You know, all Mrs. did in Sodom and Gomorrah was turn around and he turned her into a pillar of salt. That's pretty nasty. I don't know if that was necessary. I think I'd have, <laughs> I'd, I'd have to ask him. That was a bit harsh. Yeah. It's, it's maybe you know, a I think, little. I think if slapper. God exists, he's kind of like, you know, maybe the closest we got is like Kim Jong Un to, <laughs> Who God could think personality wise, right? Don't piss him off. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you fucking execute you with a fucking anti aircraft fucking weapon. Yeah, I mean, Christ, you know, and I've often said, you know, it, it wouldn't take much. I mean, there hasn't been a booming voice out of the heavens in 2000 years. I mean, if this, if there's an all powerful God, if I'm driving around, if I'm driving down the road tomorrow in my car and an invisible hand picks me up and lifts me 50 feet in the air and then some guy goes, do you believe now? I just put me down. I'll pray right now. Not a problem. This, I'm, I'm good. You know, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But the fact of the matter is, there hasn't been. No. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that bothers me about this whole stuff. And the issue would be, which God would you pray to? Because there's, you know, 4,000. There's so many. There's so you know, many. I like, to, I like to tell people, you know, I got a problem here where the Mormons won't come to my house anymore. <laughs> that, yeah, I don't call that a fucking problem. I call it a problem because I enjoy, they don't come here because I don't talk to them. They, call, they don't come here because I do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my wife actually last year, two, two years ago, she was shouting out, I had the Mormons on my line for an hour and she kept shouting out that we had to go to the grocery store thinking she was saving me from them. <laughs> when, <laughs> when in reality, I think I had the youngest guy, they send these young Americans around, right? This guy was 19 years old. I think I had him doubting. By the time he left, I could see the look in the other guy's face going, I better get him the fuck out of here. You know? You know what's really funny about that? Is that, so Edward's an, an ex-Mormon. Oh, yes, and, yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what's really funny about that is they send the young Newfie to fucking California, and they send the young Californian to fucking Newfoundland. Honestly, man, it's weird, right? That's you know, fucking I mean, crazy. I felt bad because I thought if this kid goes back and you know, takes a rifle to a shopping mall because he's doubting his God, like that, I, I have to call CNN, like that one's on me. I apologize. <laughs> I sent him home. <laughs> I made him stop believing his God. I sent him home. He went nuts. That's on me. My bad. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I couldn't get too mad because I always wanted to be the cool dad. You know what I mean? I wanted to be the kind of father who kept up with modern things and was the cool guy to hang around with. So I thought, how can I do this? And I thought, video games. I've always been good at video games. I'll play video games with them, and that way we'll connect. We'll have a connection. So I sat down to play this game, Call of Duty 4. It's a war game. 30 seconds in, I get killed. I said, what happened? It was running on the screen. 
He said, you shot you from behind. <laughs> he shot me from behind? He said, yeah, he said, it's a 3D environment. He could have got you from anywhere. He could have got you from up in a tree, up in a tank. You know, could have shot you from anywhere. And that's when I knew that video games had surpassed me. <laughs> this kind of thing never happened to Mario. <laughs> a turtle will come slowly at you. You jump over it, you down a few shrooms, you're good to go. <laughs> but as bad as I am with technology, I'm not as bad as my father, God love him. Last winter he calls me up, my sister had gone to St. John's for tea. My father calls me and says, your sister left her computer on. <laughs> I said, all right, well, you know, just... Uh, just leave it alone. It'll go into hibernation. It'll be fine. <laughs> Five minutes later, he calls me back. I think I should turn it off. <laughs> so, all right, we'll turn it off. <laughs> How do I turn it off? <laughs> do I press the blue button? I said, no, Father, you got to shut it down first. Is the blue button the power button? Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I said, no, you got to shut it down. He said, well, how do I shut it down? I said, okay, well, you see where it says start? Yeah. I said, you see a little arrow on the screen? Yeah. Move the arrow over to the start. He says, not moving. I didn't have to look. I said, Father, get your finger off the screen. <laughs> he said, what do I use? He said, what do I use? I said, there's a mouse next to the computer. The sound of a chair tipping over. And the door slamming. Reminded me of my father's fear of rodents. Now, I didn't mind getting dressed and shoveling up my car and driving through the unplowed streets of Harbor Grace and shoveling out his driveway, taking off my winter clothes, going up and shutting down the computer. I didn't mind doing any of that. But when I sat down and the trap went off... <laughs> that's the shit that'll stay with you for a while. laugh con consistently I, I can't imagine like i i find people that like you that can do that uh, uh, remarkable because to be uh, it is because it's it's a talent that really few people can do it and be consistent with it well you know i went through a bit of a dry spell last year uh because <laughs> everybody who picked up a microphone suddenly fancied themselves a professional comedian <laughs> and uh some uh, some manager would see some Someone get up and uh, not not necessarily a bad comedian by any stretch, but just not ready. And they'll do ten minutes and they'll kill and he'll say, "Oh, we can get him for half the price we're going to pay for John." And uh, all of a sudden, I'm cut out. Yeah. And then when he goes to do the gig, ten minutes into a forty-five minute set, nothing. That's right. Yeah. And that's that's got to be difficult too. I mean, especially when you know time and time again you're consistent in what you do. I mean, I think you got to be. And uh, I mean, I got a lot of repeat clients. Uh, corporate wise, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the Christmas party season and then in the spring for AGMs and conventions and stuff like that. So, I mean, I played for the same corporate audiences several times, so you gotta change it up. There's a lot more comics in, uh, Newfoundland now than there was five years ago even. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think a lot of the problem is with these, with these guys in St. John's right now is that they're falling into, uh, the romanticized version of stand up and they're falling for, uh, the age old, you got to pick up a microphone every single night. You got to get up in front of an audience every single night, which is fine if you're in Toronto, Vancouver, Chicago, New York, Boston. But St. John's is 100,000 people. Yeah. You know, you, you get up in front of a microphone every night. It's for the same fucking audience. Yeah. And so you're not progressing. Your act is not being honed. You're having, you're forcing yourself to come up with new material almost, you know, two or three times a week, and you and you're not growing as a comic. Does does that would you think that'd burn you out after a while though, wouldn't you? And I well, it is burning people out. Yeah. Gets them complacent too, right? Like they get, yeah. they get stuck on one act and they're not growing as a, I don't, I don't know the type of comics that you're into, but I, I listen to Joe Rogan's podcast a lot 
and he talks about it like sharpening a sword like you know you have new material you have to try that out but once you perfected it it's time to move on to some new material yeah i mean there's different viewpoints on it uh i mean seinfeld was doing the same stuff for years and years but it worked for him you know uh and i mean that mic bit that we just played at the beginning of this i mean i do that pretty much for the last seven years and i keep getting requests for it and stuff so i mean i keep i don't end with it anymore Sometimes I even start with it. But yeah, I mean, I do a lot of the same material if people are, if, if I know people are looking for it. Be, before we get into the stories, can you, can you give us a quick story about bombing one time? Oh God. I can, you know what? I can honestly say the only time I really, really bombed was, uh, at a place called The Rooms in St. John's, which is a museum. And, uh, I got booked to perform for the, uh, federal ministers of health from across the country and their aides and everything else. They landed in St. John's about seven, seven a.m. They went straight into meetings. They were fighting tooth and nail with each other all day long. I went on stage 10 o'clock that night, and they wanted to hear nothing from me. All, they were still glaring at each other across tables, and I had to do about 40 minutes, and it was brutal. <laughs> so it, was, it, it wasn't necessarily your act. It could have been anybody, but the room was fucking cold. Yeah, it makes no difference at that point. If it's At least, you know, even if you can say, well, I know it's not me, it's still yeah. happening to you right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it that got, would be tough. That got to be more bad though when people don't have a good sense of humor. Oh, there was there was nothing. I mean, I never got a gig, and usually if uh, usually if I'm feeling a little bit stressed during a show, and I got you know, knock on wood, it hasn't happened very often. I'll always have. I know that I got that mic bit or whatever in my back pocket that I can break out and get them back or close strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, even that just didn't get a gig that night. Oh my God! If they can't laugh at that mic bit, that. <laughs> There's not much they can laugh at. Then. Holy no kidding. Do you not think Joseph is the biggest cuckold in history? <laughs> is he not the biggest cuckold? And I and I think the manger is like is is a code word for whorehouse. And God was Look, like the. I pimp. gotta tell you, man. I got all sorts of respect for Mary. As far as excuses go for getting knocked up, jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many people can say they got they started them? You know, a billion broad. <laughs> You know, a couple billion strong religion out of uh, best excuse for getting knocked up ever. I just imagine Joseph sitting around playing poker with his buddies, right? <laughs> so this is not your kid. No, no, it's uh, it's God's. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you imagine your daughter? Uh, say, do you have a daughter, John? I do. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine your daughter coming home and pregnant, and she's saying, giving you that excuse? Well, I tell you what, man. I actually, I probably have to tip the hat. Going, you know what? That's in bed. <laughs> yeah, <he's> creative, <laughs> fucking. It's like it's like one of those fucking uh, what was that that Maury Provich talk show? It's like fucking Joseph comes out here. Here comes Mary. Kids black is all black can be. Yeah. He's like it's my kid. Fucking test results come in. It's not your kid. Fucking God is off to the side. One hundred percent possibility. It's fucking God. God <laughs> throws his hands up. It's not my fucking kid. Joseph starts crying like the cuckold he is. It's still my baby. <laughs> Fucking Mary storms off the stage like the slut that she was. <laughs> Full of beeps and everything. Yeah, it'd be yeah. awesome. Shoes but being tossed Joseph, everywhere. Yeah. I don't know, man. Joseph's got to be the, the most sympathetic character in the Bible. He he, he definitely has some redeeming qualities because he she would have been stoned to death for adult uh, for. Uh, but here's the thing, though. If you if you believe in the Trinity, which is what they do, God basically tapped his mom. Yes. So, so he could be born. Yeah. Uh, he tapped his mom for himself to be yeah. born. I mean, that's, that's weird. I don't know how, to, I don't know how they rec reconcile that. Then he, then he sent himself down and yeah. had himself tortured. Yeah. And, and, and called it a sacrifice of his son. Yet it was him. Then him and his son both went back up to heaven and the Holy Ghost, which was is like, also him, was like jerking off in the corner this whole time. It because the Holy Ghost is not fucking mentioned. So it's like, if you, if you, uh, the biggest circle jerk in history is fucking Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost. Right? If you were to try to, if you were to not be allowed to teach religion or mention religion at all until any kid was 16 years old, there would be no religion. No. Yeah, I, I've often said that. I, it's like, you take, you take a fucking, uh, like a, you know, you have those tribes that live in the bush, they, there's not too many left, but they, they don't have contact with people. And you bring one of those, those people in as an adult and you say, now, sit down. I've got a story to tell you. And you fucking feed them the line of the Christian narrative of the fucking virgin birth and the, 
resurrection out of the tomb and the fucking God and the Holy Trinity, they're going to look at you like you're fucking crazy, man. Well, you know what, though? You don't, even need to go, you don't even need to get a tribe to do that. You talk to any Christian, you talk to a Roman Catholic, uh, you go around the Bay in Newfoundland, and you find the Pentecost, Jehovah's Witness, whatever, and you tell them the story of the Mormons. You tell them, you tell them about the magic underwear and everything. And they'll look at you like you got ten heads. They'll talk about how crazy these people are. And they, you're right, but yours makes entirely, uh, yours, where there's three of them, who's actually one person, that makes all the sense in the world. <laughs> at least Mormons, the one thing that Mormons have is God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are three separate beings. Yeah. And, shut know, the fuck up, planet. Ed. You believe you get your own damn planet when you die. Listen, and you get multiple wives. What the fuck? Well, Jehovah's Witness believe that only 100,000 people or so are going to heaven. 144,000. so many people going to heaven, I wouldn't be knocking on doors. I'd be keeping that shit to myself. <laughs> yeah. That, that, we, we, had a, we had a show. We talked about this maybe, I don't know, like two weeks ago, shunning. And I said, if I was a fucking Mormon, whatever the fuck they're called, fucking bag licker, and, and, and fucking... I, I had a technical con- term, yeah. Yeah, and I had my fucking congregation of fucking dead fucking drones in there. I'd be fucking shunning all of them because I want to be one of the 144,000 that makes it into that bitch. So you yeah. better fight. You, you fart. You fucking look at me wrong and you're fucking shunned. It is a dark place in this province's history. The sexual abuse of more than 300 orphaned children at the hands of their protectors. And now the horrific story of Mount Cashel Orphanage is back in court, this time to challenge the church. ZenTV's Leila Baudouin reports the retelling of the trial is the hardest part for victims. In my opinion, we've just scratched the surface. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that haven't even come forward. There's a lot of people out there that have settled already and are still living with this because you never shake this. I live with this every day of my life. Gemma Hickey is a survivor of clergy abuse, the spark behind a life-changing foundation, Pathways. She says Mount Cashel is a wound this province needs to heal. I was silent for a very long time about my abuse because it is so personal and talking about being sexually abused by a priest is, is not easy. In April, the Roman Catholic Church is in court alongside some 60 Mount Cashel abuse survivors who are still I'm seeking Connors justice for, for crimes that happened years. a very long time ago. A six-year-old, he was physically and sexually abused. The by story Christian that broke in the, the 80s Catholic. has not ended for them. I want to see the truth come out. The Roman Catholic Church maintains it wasn't involved, yet the victims have a different memory Dana of what Lander went on in the orphanage. Beaten and sexually abused by Christian brothers at the Mount Cashel Orphanage. Inquiry lawyers say during a 1975 investigation, police recorded 25 to 30 similar complaints. No charges. We can see were... why it's very difficult for people to come forward and say that they've been harmed, but also. The, they're under the microscope. And I'm just really, really concerned for the men in this particular case now, especially because they have to testify. And I'm just thinking about them. It's an emotional battle for the victims. Hickey says she's contacted the archbishop and encouraged him to settle this once and for all. Leila Baudouin, NTV News. Um, so like the first thing that I'm going to say about this is that we know that Newfoundland isn't exactly a, a large population. Like it's a big island, but it's a small population. And to have fucking 300 children molested with such a small population is fucking mind boggling. Right. But, Absolutely. but David, that's 300 that we know of. How yeah, exactly onto their graves, taking that secret with them. And, and just aren't coming out. So let's, let's say it's another 20% or whatever. Even put, even like, we'll go, we'll go crazy because we're, cause fuck the Catholics. So say 500 out of that, out of how many people live in Newfoundland? 400,000? Uh, 520,000 right now. 500. That, that's fucking insane yep. for one organization to have done that. I'm not saying like, obviously, you know, there's assholes and children are, are molested, but, that's just one organization that did that. That's fucking mind, like, 
that makes me so fucking angry, actually, to tell you the truth. Well, I mean, Mount Cashel was one institution. I mean, there was other priests that have been nailed afterwards uh, with sexual <laughs> charges. They chose the word. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, like, you know, you had Father Hickey. Yeah, they uh, were doing the nailing. And there was uh, priests all over the island that were, were uh, molesting children. I, I'm not going to say molesting. They were raping children. Yep. And don't, yeah, don't, don't, you know, shine it over. Up until this broke in the 90s, late eight, late 80s, early 90s was when this really broke. The Catholic Church basically were kings in, in Newfoundland. They were yep. they had full control, especially in small communities. Hey, John. Oh, the priest was the law, man. The priest was the be all end all. And when you're growing up, in, um, did you go to a Catholic school, right? Yep. So, um, how, how was that? How was that? I mean, because I have no experience because I went to a non-denominational school. Listen, I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. I've, I said this in the uh, panel discussion as well, that um, we were, I think we were very fortunate with the uh, Christian brothers that we had in St. Francis. Because, uh, you know, at the time, I mean, I was probably a prime prey, you know, a smaller guy. Uh, you know, I think I think if, if any of them would have been predators, I would have been on the list, you know. And... Uh, I can honestly say, man, that uh, I'd be shocked if it, if it ever happened to, to that some one of the teachers that I had was ever brought up. I mean, 15 years after high school, I mean, I contacted Brother Murphy, uh, who was the principal at the time, uh, to tell him about my diagnosis of ADD and, you know, have a little chat and basically apologize for the way I was back then, not knowing that I had attention deficit disorder, because uh, he gave me every chance in the world to graduate high school, you know, extra exams and stuff like that. And I just, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had let him down. And so, I mean, I made contact with this guy. So there was, um, there's definitely good ones out there, you know? Yeah. And, and we, and the hard part in Newfoundland would be to, to the priest dick. No, no, but <laughs> separating the good from the bad, the, the good quote unquote good, uh, priests from the, the fucking monsters that were, that are here. They're yeah. all fucking monsters. Fuck them all. Well, I mean, I mean, there was ki- there was educators that actually did good jobs educating kids, and then there I call them groomers. They're just grooming you. Well, I mean, waiting for that opportunity. One would hope that 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 there are people out there that you know that wouldn't do that though. I mean, but the biggest thing I have with Mount Casha was, um, is that our government, because of the power of the church, um, they knew this in the seventies. Um, and they and they covered it up, and that was found out in in the report. Um, and it, it's disgusting to think that a church would have that much power in. Well, I mean, it's not yeah, and not just in small little Newfoundland either. I mean, look at uh, Boston, look at the movie Spotlight. You know, it's a uh, it's a carbon copy of Mount Cashel, only on a larger scale. Yeah, yeah and the, and the same thing happened on in Australia. But I mean, Catholics all over the world, children anyway have been raped and molested, and yet the Catholic Church stays silent on these. I mean, they move these bastards around from mm-hmm. parish to parish, yeah. and then, like, Bernard Law from uh, from Boston. That's right. They took him from Boston and brought him to the Vatican to be uh, to so he wouldn't be prosecuted. That is fucking... I mean, why isn't there a warrant out for... Uh, for and I'm going to say this point blank, why isn't there not a warrant for the uh, Pope at the time? I mean, he should have been arrested because he nothing that dra- drastic comes through without the Pope's permission. Yeah, it's every, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, once you go down that road, I think uh, it becomes impossible. Unfortunately, it's impossible. There's no way anyone uh, is going to be able to make those. Con- the Vatican is in his own country, for fuck's sake. Yeah, that's you know, that would be like trying to bring down a dictatorship, which is exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. I mean. And yet, and there's still people in, in, in the province that are, are Catholic to the core, but I think that there was a, 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 a snap, a brain snap, uh, with a lot of Catholics in Newfoundland when, when that came, when Mount Cashel, uh, came out. And, uh, I think a lot of people left the church at that time, didn't they? They did, yeah. I was very young. I was about 12 at the time when, when Mount Cashel broke, but I still remember, um, how big it was and how many people were impacted. And how many, and the sentiment around the time, because, um, I know people that were horrified to know that this was actually true and this was not just, um, a rumor or whatever. This was actually going to trial. Um, 
I don't know, John, how, uh, your recollection of the actual uh, court cases that were on trial or on TV at the time. No, I mean, I was only, uh, well, you're talking 89, I was only 15 myself at the time. And to be honest with you, you know, I had bigger fish to fry yeah. uh, at the time than uh, really watching the news, let's face it. You know, 15 yeah. years old, you didn't give a fuck, you're out doing whatever, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it wasn't on top of my watching list. No, but I, I remember uh, my uh, my parents talking about it. It was the first yeah. time I think I ever heard my uh, my mother uh, swear on uh, on a priest or on um, a religious person in my entire life. And uh, I think that the impact is still felt today. I think, I mean, still fuck, they're in court still. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it, it was the ultimate uh, look behind the curtain. You know, it was uh, the Wizard of Oz. It was that on a, on a magnitude that people couldn't comprehend because for so long the priests were the power in the community and they were the respect in the community and they were the threat of the community. You know, do do this or I'm going to bring you over to Father So and So. And you know, oh uh, yeah, and and one of the things I think that uh, really happened we went from den- uh, denominational schools to non-denominational schools overnight. You know, yep. I mean, you would never have heard of that. Uh, Five years before uh, the Mount Cashel broke, it would never have passed in Newfoundland. You see, you see this type of backlash against the Catholic Church in Ireland too for kitty fucking, as well. Like the the number of Catholics in Ireland has been dropping for a while, and they're like they still the Catholic Church obviously still has a stronghold in Ireland, but their influence is dropping. But I mean, it must be the most embarrassing time for people to try to look at you with a straight face and say that that they're a Catholic. And when you call them out on being a Catholic and saying, you're a Catholic, fucking, you belong to a criminal organization, and then they try to tell you that they don't take part in it, and then you say, well, do you tithe? And if they say, yeah, then they, com- then, then they take part in it, and they're complicit in it. The hardest part, I think, about, uh, for me, is knowing that some of these people um have have committed suicide have taken their lives the chil- you know the victims in this case um and they will never see justice they will never you know and many of these guys have gone to their graves thinking that they they were something wrong with them when it wasn't there was nothing wrong with them it was these bastards that raped them and that, that's something that is hard to grip Take- well, no, you know, people and people focus on the priests and, uh, oh, you know, I turn, oh, they're a bad seed or whatever. But you know what? The thing that they're missing in all of that and the thing that I try to tell people is that, you know, if they're still saying they're Catholic or whatever, is that, you know what? Not only are you complacent in it, but you're saying that this all powerful father figure watched this happen. Yeah. Let's not forget that there's yeah. a deity behind yeah. all of this. For sure. You know, and, and that if you're, if, and the question is, and why, why just before he sticks his dick in a kid, why don't you just give him a heart attack or something? Yeah, I mean, why, why does God get off on it? Why does God get off scot free on this? Yeah, why, is, why did he not prevent it? I mean, if he can't save a child, yeah. a helpless child, how can, how can anybody, res- even if he does exist, which I don't believe for a, a minute. But even if he did exist, how could you have any respect for that? Cre- uh, you know. Well, how could you think of him as a loving father, God? Uh, he's definitely not. He's definitely well, not. So, what what is the 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 atmosphere like for like for religion mo- moving forward? Like, obviously, now the Catholics are back in the the fucking spotlight over this. Um, who are the Catholics? Still, the biggest religion on the island, or or should I say the rock? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, I think by by far. And yeah. you know what? It wasn't that always that way. Uh, in the uh, 1700s, the Catholics were almost because of a lot of people from England came here first. Uh, you know, well, that's how yeah. I mean, say, the Church yeah, of England was established long before the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and they used to have to have mass uh, underground, and uh, it was outlawed up until uh, the mid 1600s. So it's like when they got a foothold, they took it and ran with it. But yeah, absolutely, like they always do. The first schools were set up by Catholics in Newfoundland. Yeah, absolutely, or little one-room schools. Yeah, and it was a front for fucking kitties. Does well, Newfoundland have a uh, public, like a publicly funded 
separate school system, Catholic funded system, like they do in Ontario? No, there's no private school system. No, okay. we do have one private school in St. John. Oh, a couple of private schools in St. John's. One is called St. Bonnet. No, no, it's said publicly. Oh, funded. right, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's not publicly funded. It has you have to bankroll at your own. Yeah. No, okay. you guys don't have public schools. Yeah, we have public schools. Yeah, but not public Catholic schools or public. Okay, so so in Ontario, which is completely fucked up, we have public school and then we have publicly funded Catholic school. So basically, which we're which is completely fucked. Like, it's so fucked. But see, we used to have that system, um, up until 1997. Um, at, uh, basically, I think what ended that whole denominational system was Mount Cashel. Mount Cashel wiped that off the map. Now, Brian Tobin, I think, was the premier at the time, and he brought it in. Um, I think it's an amendment 17 to our pro- for provincial constitution that, um, ended the, uh, denominational school system. And yep. all schools re- went to the crown, basically, at that point. Well, we definitely need to take a, a chapter from, from that and look at our own effect. Look at Catholic, our own in, yeah, in Ontario, the Catholic for sure. System and... um, so not living in Newfoundland, I wouldn't know this, and maybe you guys don't know this, but how um, the victims and the families um, and the communities that were victimized by this, how did they move forward or... Like now that it's back in the news, has it brought back up to the surface the bullshit that happened in the past? Not to not to the degree you would hope. I would, you know, I would hope that it would cause a lot more outrage than it has. And I think um, with the way the news, even back in uh, eighty nine, ninety, when this was breaking, you know, you basically had um, TV news and the newspaper. So, but now with all the social media and everything, and uh, the different ways people can voice stuff. I think uh, news, unfortunately, dies out pretty quick now, and they're on to the next hottest topic. And uh, I just don't think there's as much outrage about this as I would like to see, anyway. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of the victims in in, in Newfoundland, a lot of them are unnamed for obvious reasons. But um, the one good thing that they did at, that came from all this is that the fucking Mount Cashel was destroyed. And now yes. that's a supermarket. Um, but these fellas are... Um, and I'll say fellas because it was all boys that we know of. Um, they, these guys were all, um, waiting for a settlement that was supposed to come to them that never came because the Christian brothers, uh, declared bankruptcy. So now they're fighting the Catholic Church. So there's a shopping, uh, you were saying, Edward, there's a shopping, uh, center over top of it. Now, when they tore it down, did they have to pay out the Catholics for the land? No, they didn't take, they didn't, uh, they repossessed it basically. It was an allotment given to the Catholics for the actual um, orphanage, because it was the only orphanage in the province. So people from all over the province came, like the children from all over the province went there. And when they took that out of the pro, uh, when they um, it, w- it was vacant for a number of years. So when they they repossessed it and just plowed it over without yeah. permission. Yeah, well that's good because fuck them if they want to fucking. Like, it's bullshit that they don't have to pay property tax like everybody else. Like, there's a, a prime fucking area in, in Ottawa called Orleans, and, like, the houses out there are really expensive, and the the gray nuns have, like, a huge swath of land, like, right in the middle, and, you know, they don't have to pay fuck all on it. And you could probably build a good, you know, 150 homes on it or, you know, five condo buildings where the government would be generating a lot of revenue out of it, but we get fucking sweet dick all because somebody believes in fucking Jeebus. Yep. Well, I mean, and that's another thing. I mean, uh, the amount of money the Catholic Church takes in, even in Newfoundland, is astronomical. And Yeah, and if you put $5 in an envelope, if you put five cents in a collection basket, you're contributing to the payoff of uh, rape. Yeah, yeah, and the hiding of fucking criminals. The hi- you're like, condoning it. You're condoning, you're condoning the fact that when the Catholic Church finds out that they have a priest that has been raping children, what they do is they do not hand them over to the police like fucking every fucking normal human being would. Like you have two two types of people in this world, or most people other than these fuckers. You have the type of person that when they find out that they know somebody that's been raping fucking children, they beat them near death, or they call the police and have them arrested. Yep. Catholic Church does neither of those things. 
It moves no, them and you to name another any location. Other organization, any company in the world that would try that. There isn't any. With all the finery that they have, all their, all, you know, the the gold medallion crucifixes, and yeah, they shit on gold, Edward. But I mean, how how in the hell? I mean, people can people say that they do good for the poor? There's people in Newfoundland. I mean, Newfoundland up to uh, relatively recently, you never see homeless people. Now you're starting to see it. But I mean. If we took all the money that we give to churches and actually put it into affordable housing, uh, food banks, we could actually do a lot of good here in Newfoundland. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I um, I do a lot of gigs in Halifax, and uh, I can walk down the road in Halifax, and uh, say I'll go, I'll go the same distance in St. John's, and I'll see five times as many homeless people in St. John's as in Halifax. Yeah, that are in Halifax. Yeah, out on the street. Oh. I see. There's a lot more people out on the street. Uh, with their cups in front of them in St. John's and they're in Halifax. Yeah, and that's a relatively recent thing, though, in the last, what, 10 years, you'd say, I'd say? 10 or 15 years, yeah. What, are they too lazy to go to Vancouver? What the fuck? <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, it's really ridiculous, though, that we, as a, as a society, not just Newfoundland and Labrador, but, I mean, in this entire country, allow religious people to ha- or religious institutions to, to be tax-free. I, it's, it's unfathomable. I mean, you talk about, I mean... In the States, in Canada, uh, in any developed country, if, if the churches had to pay taxes, number one, they'd fold. Uh, but number two, I mean, if they didn't fold and they actually paid out the taxes, my Christ, man, every deficit would be almost erased. In the, especially in the U.S., where they generate those from those mega churches, like those huge, huge profits. Oh, they kill me. They kill me. Yeah. And you know what? I'll, I'll watch, I'll be flicking through the channels and I'll specifically turn on like Joel Olstein, who is, a magnificent speaker. And that's what, that's what turns people towards assholes like him. Most of the people that are sending like Joel Olstein and the other fucking charlatans money are elderly. I consider it elderly abuse because they use the language and the terms to, to really get to the elderly. Like when they're asking him to, to send money, they speak about, you know, send us this money and God's going to do good things for your family. And I just, I, I really think that they're, Targeting well, John Oliver did a great bit on that, where he kept sending in money. Yeah, that was that was brilliant. It was brilliant, absolutely. No other word for it. Do you think that that changed one of those poor people's minds? That's, absolutely that's... not. No, because unfortunately, the people watching uh, a guy like Oliver are people like us, and uh, yeah. people who don't people who, people are very very cautious about having their faith shaken. You know, one of the things my father likes to say is like, "There's a lot of intelligent people in the world who believe in God." I was like, yeah, because I don't, and I mentioned this before, I don't think they've directed their intelligence towards that. Listen, tell your dad there's a lot of intelligent people in the world that also think that Sasquatches are real and aliens have abducted them. So, Hey, man, that's all real. Yeah, yeah exactly. Don't be, don't be discounting Sasquatch. <laughs> the Sam Squatch. I've been hanging out with trailer, bo- trailer Park Boys too much. Exactly, yeah, Sam Squatch. Uh but yeah, I mean, and there was a time when 100% of the world believed, but like I said, that's the Dark Ages. Yeah, yeah, but right, but even at... even like even then, shortly after that, people started to not believe, right? And I've I've said, you know, once you see the crack, you can't unsee it. Uh, how do you think that? Uh, how can we, as a community, really highlight this? I think maybe um, maybe we should be doing a lot more. Too. And then, and you know what we we talked about earlier about um, about me bringing it bringing it into the act, and uh, I think maybe in the past year and a half, two years even, the reason I've really started to think about that is because realizing that you know what I do I do have a bit of a name now in the province, and I do have a bit of a platform, and if I don't take responsibility and uh, speak up, because you know the religious side they are speaking up, they're always speaking up, mm-hmm. and people I've. You know, close friends of mine have said, uh, geez, if you don't believe in nothing, just why do you bother with them? Well, because they're dangerous. You know, I think religion is dangerous. Uh, whether it's priests fucking kids or whether it's people blowing up buildings, it's dangerous. And I think if I got a bit of a platform and if I got a bit of a name in the province, it's almost a responsibility. And if I don't, I feel like I'm being complacent and stuff. Well, John, you wouldn't believe the number of... Um, uh threats I had gotten since when I went on uh, open line and uh, talked about that the Christian flag that was put up in the Confederation building. Right. And this was from my home province, which I thought we could have, you know, which usually under any other topic, 
you can argue tooth and nail with somebody and you'd go away, ha- you know, shake your head and everybody would be fine. Go for a beer afterwards. Well, you know, I called in, I called in a couple of times. I called, last time I called in about religion was when Patty Daly had made, he's the host of the Open Line show, for those who don't know. He, uh, he had made the comment about there are no atheists in foxholes. And I just got oh, sick of hearing that. Oh, that's such fucking bullshit. It's bullshit. I mean, there's the American Association, American Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers. You know, there's thousands, there's been thousands of atheists in foxholes. Er- Ernest Hemingway was a foxhole atheist. I mean, come on. And I just think that, you know, and, and Patty kind of shrugs it off, saying, ah, boy, it's an expression. Well, yeah, it's a wrong expression. Well, almost, almost 50% of the population in Canada, it, it, uh, in demographically, is called non-believer. I won't say that they're full, like, they don't come out and say that they're atheists, but they say they, they don't have a religion and they don't necessarily believe in God. So you're trying to tell me that almost 50% of the population out of the, out of that, you know, half of the military, none of them are atheists and foxholes? Fuck yeah. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. very simple why this uh, process happened so quickly. She had two great promoters. One was John Paul II and one was Pope Francis. For Pope Francis, Mother Teresa felt in a special way God's tenderness and mercy, and she knew how to share that with others. Uh, It's uh, it's a great emotion, but uh, I think uh, most of all, we are thankful to her for the message for really changing our lives with our example humility. I think it, that she spreads an amazing message. She was an amazing woman and so I think it's really important that this day has finally come for a lot of people. I'm a doctor by profession and the teachings of um, Mother Teresa has helped me a lot to understand the concept of love. Love for the poorest of the poor. That helps me a lot in my practice. Well, Mother Teresa was a fanatic, um, fundamentalist, and a fraud. She was not a friend of the poor, as she claimed to be. She was a friend of poverty. Preached it as a, as a good thing, as a gift from God, something to be welcomed along with other kinds of suffering. Wasn't interested in alleviating it. Was a friend of the rich. Took money from the Duvalier family in Haiti, one of the most obscenely bloated uh, dynastic dictatorships in history. Uh, took money from Charles Keating, the man who robbed Americans blind through the Lincoln Savings and Loan. Stolen money. Um, all to build convents in her own name, uh, more than 200 of them around the world, in order to found an order that bore her name. This is not modesty either, nor is it humility. It doesn't exhaust my critique of her either. Um, we all know there is a cure for poverty. It's a rudimentary one. It does work, though. It works everywhere for the same reason. It's colloquially called the empowerment of women. It's the only thing that does work. If you allow women control over, some control over their cycle of reproduction, so that they're not chained by their husbands or by village custom to annual animal type pregnancies, early death, disease, and so on. If you will free them from that, give them some basic uh, health of that sort, and if you're generous enough to throw in perhaps a handful of seeds and a bit of credit, the whole floor, culturally, socially, medically, uh, economic of that village will rise. It works every time. Mother Teresa spent her entire life campaigning against that outcome. She said that contraception was equivalent to abortion morally, and abortion was morally equivalent to murder. She was entirely against the only thing that cures poverty. I would say that her preachments led to an enormous increase in the amount of poverty, ignorance, filth, and disease in the world. And I would further add, without embarrassment, that it's off those things that the Roman Catholic Church has always fed and made its living. She, she, uh, the hospitals that she set up were, they were saying that she was so great to people and suffering was fucking bullshit. There's people in pain that needed morphine that were only getting Tylenol all day. The beds they slept on were shit. All at the same time, she was sending millions and millions of dollars back to the Vatican. Oh, I mean, 
they she requested that her nuns reuse needles, and they weren't allowed to sterilize them. They had to use cold water to rinse them off, and to be reused on other people. There was a 15-year-old boy who had a curable uh, kidney infection that was left unattended, and because he she wanted him to suffer as Christ suffered, and he died. To to allow that to happen is horrible at best and criminal at worst. As this woman does not deserve a uh, uh, praise, does does not deserve a sainthood. She deserves. To, uh, she's dead now, but if when she was alive, she deserved prison. Um, and that's my take on her. Yep, hard to argue. And it, I read an article the other day that said go that, back through uh, history. Most of the saints, though, and you'll find a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. I read an article the other day that said that um, Mother Teresa put Calcutta back by a decade. Like, it'll take a decade to recover from what she did to Calcutta. It's um, insane. She, she wouldn't allow contracept- contraception. And ca- I mean, in Calcutta, it's overpopulation that's causing the ma- major problem. I mean, poverty, when she, when she talked about poverty, she didn't talk yeah, about... Yeah, but the brown, Edward. You know, not just brown. She said the poor of the world shouldn't should remain poor. She didn't. She didn't think that they should come out of poverty. Yeah, but Cal is. Oh yeah. yeah, and that's the whole point. That's the reason. Cares. One of the reasons why the third world is doing so bad is because and left them to criminal agencies like the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Fuck Mother Teresa. She was a whore. A nasty old uh, wickedy witch whore. Well, Ugly as shit too, right? Eh? Well. <laughs> Like a fucking dirt road ugly, like like Northern Ontario dirt road ugly. You'd pat, you'd even pass her up at the end of the night on George <laughs> yeah. Street. I mean, like in 2003, we found that she didn't even believe the cat in the Catholic doctrine anyway. She uh, she had doubts, but the Catholic um, Pope at the time, Pope John Paul II, encouraged her on and to do as much as she could. To bring fame to or to glory to God, basically, to no, 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 fame to the Catholic Church. No, you Catholic had it right Church. the first time. Yeah, and to to bring them to yeah, they were they promise. needed a lot of good publicity. Yeah, yeah, and she did that, uh, and that's the scary part that even non-believers today think she's a good person, which is scary. Well, well yeah, it's like you hear people when they make a mistake or they do something like that's normally not within like say standard morals and they say well i'm no mother Teresa." well i say yeah, i'm, I'm exactly. no motherfucking true i'm no motherfucking Teresa because i don't fucking like i don't get off on people's suffering i don't think people should suffer it's not something that that i that i enjoy you know i, I like people to to have health care i want them to be better i don't want them to fucking wallow and swallow because you believe in fucking nonsense a fairy tale something that doesn't even fucking exist there's like you have to suspend your own reason to have faith you have to suspend (laughs) your own reason to to believe uh, in god yeah i mean the whole the whole thing if you were to bring that to uh if you were to put that in an original script and say nobody had heard of religion before and brought that to a hollywood producer they'd laugh at you yeah the plot does not make any sense no but how can you, in good conscience, take money from the Duvalier family uh, in Haiti? I mean, these guys were cruel bastards to, to poor of Haiti. In fact, it got so bad that the that the Haitian people overtook the Duvalier family and they fled to France. How is Mother Teresa any better than that family, though? She's not. She no. actually caused more suffering. On a w- family. So how is it even a surprise? Why are you even shocked that she took money from these people? No, what, uh, what I'm saying... Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, how can you be shocked when the whole Catholic Church, the whole system... I mean, the Vatican was built on uh, greed and money and lust and... Uh, it's unbelievable. You know, the whole thing was the original mafia. They, they shit on gold toilets. They yeah. stare at gold ceilings. Mm-hmm. But I mean, Yet three-quarters of the world... Is starving. Yeah, but how does the world? And I'm not just talking about Catholic 
people, believers. I'm talking about non-believers worldwide that still say that she was a good person. She did good yeah. for the police. Where? Show me a non-believer that says that. I, I'm just and talking, I'll slap oh, I'm the sure shit that. out of him. I was I was talking to a guy the other day. She thought she was a wonderful person, and Where then the fuck I tra- I'll slap your mouth. I mean, I'm t- telling him about you know what she did with the, the um, John Keating. She took a million and a half bucks from him, to, gave him a cross, and tried to give him a character reference. Not even meeting the dude um, for return a hand job. Yeah, and no, she- if you're gonna take a million dollars from the dude, at least give him a hand job. A little handy. She Let was me- milking that prostate. <laughs> oh yeah, Mother Teresa. <laughs> Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> Look at your fucking headdress, yeah. So sexy, the fucking road map of fucking wrinkles on your face, yeah. When you come on Mother Teresa's face, it takes an hour for your cum to come off because of all the fucking wrinkles. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like pouring milk through an ant farm. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks a lot, John. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. But uh, and I gotta say, it's been awesome, and uh, I look forward to hearing you on, on the show on the road sometime. This was the Wayward Atheist podcast. Visit our new website at waywardatheists.com. Follow us on Spreaker, spreaker.com slash waywardatheists. You can email us at waywardatheistpodcast at gmail dot com. Find us on Twitter at waywardatheists and on facebook.com slash waywardatheists. If you enjoy our content, feel free to leave us a review on iTunes, and feel free to support us at patreon.com slash waywardatheists.